This is investigation number three of chemical reactions. And this is the reaction that we're going to perform today in the lab. On the reactant side, we have acetone and iodine. And on the product side, we have monoiodoacetone and hydrogen iodide. You can see that HCl is only a catalyst in this reaction. Unlike our last two investigations where we followed chemical reactions by looking at product formation, in this experiment we're actually going to look at the disappearance of one of the reactants as the reaction occurs. And that's going to be iodine. And we'll look at that using a spectrophotometer. But first, Phil's preparing six tubes in which we're going to do the reactions. Each of these graduated centrifuge tubes are filled with increasing amounts of acetone. The first tube has one milliliter of acetone and it increases by one up until six milliliters in the final tube or tube number six. Students may comment that the acetone smells like something that's very familiar and if they think about it they'll probably decide that it smells like fingernail polish remover and most of the fingernail polish removers that have been used for years consist mainly of acetone in fact. Okay so once the acetone is in each of the tubes we'll then move on to adding various volumes of water. We'll add five milliliters of water to the first tube which had one milliliter of acetone. So it'll be a total volume of water and acetone of six mils. The second tube will add four milliliters of water. And with the two milliliters of acetone that we added earlier, that'll give us the exact same volume of the water acetone mixture, or six mils. And we'll do that all the way across until the water and the acetone is added in the proper amounts to each of the tubes. Now comes the HCl, the hydrochloric acid, and we'll add the same amount of HCl, which is again a catalyst in this reaction, to each of the tubes, and that is two mils. So essentially, he's going to be taking each of the tubes up to eight mils by adding the hydrochloric acid. And he does that to each of the six tubes. And that essentially prepares the tube for us because the next reagent or the next reactant that we would add would be iodine. And iodine will react immediately and as it's used up it'll begin losing its color. And we're going to look at that loss of color in terms of absorption in the spectrophotometer. But first, to use the spectrophotometer, Phil's got a blanket. He set the wavelength at 460 nanometers. So this will be the wavelength that we use to blank the spectrophotometer. So he's made up a mixture of the acetone, water, and HCl, just like all six of the reactions, and he uses that to blank. So he pushes the blank button and waits until he gets an absorption of zero. So that would be the absorption of all of the reactants except for iodine, which we'll be measuring in our readings. Okay, now to initiate the reaction in the first tube, Phil's going to add two milliliters of this iodine solution. So he'll add this up to the 10 mil mark, quickly replace the cap, and invert the reaction several times. And as soon as he begins inversion, he begins timing the reaction. He then pours a sample into the cuvette and introduces it into the chamber of the spectrophotometer and begins reading. So as we look at this reaction on the spectrophotometer, you can see that it has an absorption of 0.8 something, and that number is decreasing as we watch it. 
What we're actually looking at here, and this is quite fascinating, we're looking at the disappearance or the using up of the iodine as the reaction progresses. So we're looking at the disappearance of one of the reactants rather than the formation of the product. So he's going to take this all the way down to zero, which will mean that there's no more iodine and it gets back to the levels of the blank. And here we come. And so he stops the stopwatch and we're going to record the amount of time that it took in reaction number one or tube number one for all the iodine to be used up. And with that reading, we empty out the cuvette, we'll rinse it out, I'm just rinsing it out with water in this case, and we'll spill that into waste, and we'll get ready for the next reaction. He resets the stopwatch so he's ready to go and gets ready to do tube number two. Remember, in tube number two, there's a higher concentration of acetone. Okay, so we start the reaction, and now with the increased amount of acetone, we're going to take a look at how this affects the disappearance of the iodine. So we quickly transfer it, quickly and carefully transfer it to the cuvette, place it, and watch what happens. So we immediately see that the absorption's going down. Again, what's important for us in terms of measuring in this experiment is the actual time that it takes for the reading to come down to zero in absorbance because that means that the iodine is gone at that point and we're interested in how the concentration of the reactants affects the speed at which a reaction takes place. Okay, so now that we're at zero, the iodine's gone and he stops the clock. You can see there, and that was a good reading, it was 0 .002, but you could see it wasn't changing. If that happens, that's where you stop the clock. So now we just keep moving on. You can see we've skipped a few of the readings here, and we're at reading number six, or trial number six. And this will have the highest concentration of one of the reactants, the acetone. So let's see how quickly this reaction takes place. Mixes it, stopwatch is on now. So he's timing even as he's transferring, so it's not a real rush. But let's see how fast this is going down. Okay, our first reading, we're down to five. Look at how fast the spectrophotometer is losing absorption. This is how fast the iodine is being used up in this reaction in tube number six. I think this is really a remarkable reaction for students to do because they can actually see with their own eyes how fast a reaction occurs depending solely on the concentration of the reactants. So in the first two investigations, we followed a chemical reaction by looking at the formation of a product. And in this third investigation, we follow the chemical reaction by looking at the disappearance of one of the reactants. Combined with data analysis and classroom discussion, students should be getting a very good hands-on feel for chemical reactions.